My name's Ken Carlson. I'm an attorney specializing in tenant law since 1980. This is the next in a series of free consultations brought to you by my website, caltenantlaw.com. Today, we're going to talk about the actual eviction lawsuit, as my firm does it, so that you understand what to expect. I'll be referring to my unlawful detainer game board shown here, which is a flowchart of the court process. It would be helpful for you to get a copy of that from the caltenantlaw.com website to look at while I'm talking. You can download the free PDF or buy a hard copy that's mailed to you. Matrix is a handy allegory for how you think the eviction goes versus how it really is. The rights you have, that I discussed in the earlier videos of this series, are supposed to be applied by the judge. You walk into court and justice is done, right? In fact, that's not what happens at all. Eviction is just a dispute over who has the right to possession, but the eviction law, Code of Civil Procedure 1161, says you are guilty of unlawful detainer. Guilty, like a criminal for standing up for your rights against the landlord. It is the only non-criminal case where you are guilty of it. The landlord's trespass, stealing your property, and fraud are crimes. But if you sue him, he just trespassed, converted, and defrauded you. He's not called guilty. The eviction stigma starts with the law itself. An eviction is the fastest lawsuit in California, with three-day and five-day deadlines and lockouts all helping landlords evict you before you can even find a lawyer to help you. The landlord's side is simple, but your side is complicated. His paperwork is simple check-the-box forms, but yours requires a lawyer to prepare at greater expense. The judges are chummy with the landlord's lawyers, but often mean to the tenants. Actually, beating the other side of, in an eviction case is easy. It's getting the judges and clerks to follow the law that's the tough part. The bias by the courts against the tenants is unbelievable. It's worse than that, but you get the idea. Not only do you have to fight for your rights, but you have to fight the legal system itself. I wish I was kidding. I've done this for over 40 years, and it just gets worse. It is for that reason that the game board, our strategy, and the Cal Tenant Law System exist. The landlord wants to scare you out quickly, and the legal system helps him do it. I use this game board as a different way of looking at it. A game, not the boogeyman. It is a game. There are rules of how it's done, limited resources you need to optimize, traps and safe zones, shortcuts and long cuts, skill and luck, a referee who makes the calls right or wrong, with a clock ticking and high stakes mounting. How is it not a game? But it is a game that you can win, and will win, in real terms, at the very least, to get you the extra time that you need, but at most, a wonderful reversal of fortune and great rewards. Personally, I really enjoy taking down those bullies to get you what you wanted and more. For you, it will be an empowering and life-changing experience. You will find within yourself the courage you need to press on and grow your self-respect as a new you. I put the game board on my website, exposing most of the strategy we'll be using where landlords and their lawyers can see it, just like this video. Why do I do that? It's like the chess player who says, I'll have you in checkmate in three moves. Why does he say that? Because it won't make any difference. The game board says, says to your landlord's face, this is what I'm going to put you through if you want to fight me. And you can't do anything about it. Checkmate in three moves. Let's get into it. In the earlier videos, I explained about the notices given or not given, correctly or incorrectly, based upon the circumstances of your situation. 
The proper service of those notices that have to be done before the eviction case is filed is a completely different service of papers than we're talking about here. Those were do-it-or-else letters, but now we're at the actual lawsuit phase. The landlord files the eviction case, called an unlawful detainer, in the courthouse that handles evictions in your area. The court filing clerk stamps a case number on all the papers, adds more papers to be served on you, and mails you a notice of filing that your eviction has begun. Included in that batch of papers is a prejudgment claim of right to possession to be filed by anyone who lives there but is not named as a defendant in order to assert their rights. Basically, speak now or forever hold your peace. In order for the court to be able to make a decision that affects your rights, under constitutional due process of law, it has to first have what is called personal jurisdiction over you. Without that, the cause cannot proceed any further. To make that happen, the summons and complaint have to be served on you in the proper way. It is at the point of that service of the court papers where you join the game. If you haven't been served the summons by the time you get the clerk's notice of filing, you can show that notice to the court clerk and get a sneak peek copy of the complaint. Within a few days of that, a process server will come to your door to serve you with the summons, complaint, and other papers at about the same time. A sheriff can also be hired to do it, but they're just acting as a courier. They are required to serve you, one, in person, or two, if after trying that, they can hand it to someone else who lives there. Or, three, if after, if after trying to, uh, to do those a few times, they can get the judge to order that they can serve you by posting and certified mail. The problem is that process servers lie, which is why the clerk is required to send you the notice of filing. It's perjury, uh, but because they work for the landlord, the judge overlooks it. I had a client whose passport was stamped in Bombay, on the day the process server swore that he personally served my client. The judge just laughed and said it must have been a case of mistaken identity. With whom? The door? Typically, the process server just tacks or tapes it on the door without any further effort and claim that they personally served you. Most tenants don't know that it was improperly served or that they can challenge that, which is why that's standard practice for the process servers. First, you don't have to open the door, talk through the door, or make yourself available. It's best if you avoid the process server. Sometimes they stand out there for an hour, pounding on the door and saying things like, open up in the name of the law, and I know you're in there, I see your car in front they'll eventually get tired and go away. Rather than come back until they do it uh, correctly, they just tack it on the door, sign the proof of service that they personally served you, and even make up stories like they talked to you through the door. Sometimes they don't even leave a copy at all. As you might have suspected, it's like the game of tag. If they haven't tagged you, you're not it. If you have not been properly served, either because they are lazy liars or you've avoided being served, a motion to quash tells the judge that you haven't uh, properly been served so that the court doesn't yet have jurisdiction over you to proceed any further. It's a strange motion because you need a copy of the complaint in your hands to know where to file it, the case number, and the name and address of the lawyer for the landlord to whom you must send a copy of it. Yes, you have it, but you weren't properly served. You only have five court days to file a response from when they may claim to have served you. The day of service is day zero of five. Weekends and legal holidays don't count so you have about a week after the day of service to file. If it is posted and mailed, you get 10 more days, which you can calculate from the certified mail postmark 
and online by USPS tracking. If you don't get that certified mail, they may not have done it. Or you might get the mail but no posting. You don't know what they will claim. That is the trap. You can't wait until they file their proof of service, because they only do that when they're taking your default, meaning you lost the case and it's too late. You have to assume the worst. So, if you haven't been served at all, you file the motion to quash. If you found it posted on your door, you assume that they claim it was handed to you. You file that motion to quash to avoid that default. Best to take action early rather than too late. Using information from the complaint, you file the motion to quash. It's not a court form. We have to prepare it for you on pleading paper. Even if you were properly served, a special type of motion to quash called a delta motion can be filed at this time as well. The landlord is caught in his own trap. You will notice in the motion that we say you are submitting on the papers. That means you'll not be personally attending the hearing on the motion to quash, but let the papers speak for you. You have nothing more to add. If you did uh, attend, they would just personally serve you there in the courtroom, and you lose all the benefits. You want a fair and intelligent judge who will follow the law, not a puppet for the landlord. The bench officers assigned to decide eviction cases tend to be pro-landlord. A commissioner is hired by the courthouse to play judge, and a judge pro tem is a volunteer local lawyer who is playing judge for the day. To get rid of these biased judges, your motion to quash says that you don't stipulate to a commissioner or judge pro tem, and you file a peremptory challenge to a particular judge. We know the judges well enough to identify who to avoid. Your case is then transferred to another courtroom, and probably for a later date. It could be a week to a couple of months before your motion to quash is decided, adding extra time for you up front. The filing fees charged by the court are $235 to $435 per defendant. To save you that expense, we prepare the fee waiver forms if you qualify to do so. Most of our clients do qualify for a fee waiver. The motion to quash is strange in another way, because if you win it, you have to file a new one right away to avoid a default. If you lose it by mistake of the judge, which is almost always happens, that is what you want. That way, you can get even more time up front challenging that mistake and make them do it over with a different judge. The day after the hearing, you go to the court, get the ruling and other papers that we direct you to get, and send them to us for an evaluation of your next step. You have about five to ten days from the day the motion to quash uh, was heard to file your next papers. Act early to avoid missing a deadline. The usual next step is a type of mini-appeal from the motion to quash ruling called a petition for writ of mandate. It is to tell the appeal court about that mistake. If they disagree, you still have another 15 days to file your next papers after they mail their ruling. If they agree with you, they tell the judge to change or undo his order, and you get a new judge in a loop back to the beginning. That process can take months. If the new judge makes a mistake, as they usually do, you can file another petition, and you have another loop. I've had as many as seven of these loops, and in one case spent a whole year at this one stage before the landlord finally gave up. All during that time, you're staying in possession, paying no rent, doing whatever you want, while the landlord spins his wheels. All he has to do is follow the law. He refuses, so he loses. Remember that at this stage, we haven't even gotten to the issues in the case. We're just talking about whether or not you were properly served with the papers. 
in two types of cases, we can do what's called a removal of your case to federal court, literally making a federal case out of it. The first is, if you're the tenant of a foreclosed landlord claiming protection under the federal law called the Protecting Tenants at Foreclosure Act, the PTFA. And under that law, you can remove the case to the federal court. The second is if the landlord is outside of California, suing you for more than 75000 You can remove the case before the motion to quash or after your writ petition. Unfortunately, federal judges don't want to handle eviction cases, so they find any excuse to return the case to state court. But just that process can add one to three months more time for you. All that is, is decided is where the case will be heard, nothing about the issues in dispute. Whether you remove the case to federal court or not, the next step is discovery. The landlord wants to tell a whopper of a lie at trial, catching you by surprise, so, so you will be unable to disprove it. To find out what he plans to claim, what evidence he has, and how strong his case is against yours before trial, you conduct discovery. While you can take his deposition, those are expensive. Generally, we do it on paper, requests for admission, interrogatories, and requests for production. If the landlord admits a fact, it's proven. Interrogatories are questions, and his answers are evidence at trial. Producing receipts, letters, photographs, notices, etc. supplies evidence you need to win, and you see what he has for his case. Discovery includes using a subpoena to get witnesses and evidence papers from other sources. The landlord usually avoids answering, so you have to file a motion to compel to get a court order that he has to give you the information. Discovery is expensive and optional, but highly recommended. Discovery costs the landlord a lot, too, more than he is also losing in rent. He sees that you are finding his most vulnerable points and things he has not considered. If you start early, he worries about where you're going with all these crazy questions. The judge can postpone trial until you get that information. Bully arrogance turns to fear, and that sinking feeling that you are going to win. This section in the middle of the game board is about default. It can happen at any time because oh, you weren't served with the summons and complaint or some other or, uh, uh, notice, you missed a deadline by mistake, or the court clerk screwed up, any number of things. It's basically the dirty tricks department. I put it here because it can happen, and you need to know that you can undo losing and get back on track. Sometimes it's as simple as talking to the clerk supervisor, but other times it requires a formal motion and hearing and an ex parte application to stop the lockout in a dramatic cliffhanger. It's just important that you know that if you're faced with losing other than from a trial, you can fix it. There are procedures to follow, but almost always the default is undone and you go back to where you were in the game board. Your side of the case will be in your answer. We're not there yet on the game board. The motion to quash was only about getting the first papers. The demur only says that you're not being accused correctly. It is very technical. We're not discussing the truth except as to inconsistencies. You may wonder, with a simple check-the-box form, how can they screw that up? You'd be surprised. The details of a demur are too varied to cover, but I'll, I'll give you a few examples. The landlord accuses you of breaking the lease by doing X, but the lease doesn't prohibit that. The landlord accuses you of not paying late fees, but the late fees are illegal. The landlord gives you the wrong notice, or the notice is missing the required name of the person to pay. The lease was already dead by a prior notice, so there's no lease in effect from which to charge rent. 
or the landlord is using an unregistered DBA, so he can't sue. Or the property manager is not a real estate broker, so he can't sue. You get the idea. You have us write it up for you. The demur is set for hearing about a month away in most cases. The landlord can try to have it earlier, but if you win the demur, the case can be thrown out and you win. Or the complaint might have to be rewritten to fix the problems that your demur identified. The new complaint might have other defects, so you file another demur to that, and so on, and so forth. It's another looping possibility. The demur and discovery are on the same level in the game board because they should both be going on at the same time. The landlord is doubling his expense and frustration. You're holding up his eviction and digging into details he wants hidden. The demur raises problems with his case that you're digging into with your discovery. He might lose the case on technicalities he hadn't considered or know about. You are building evidence for your lawsuit against him. You are winning the psych war. The judge hearing the demur can sustain the demur dismissing the case, or require the landlord to rewrite his complaint, or overrule it, meaning that the complaint is good enough to proceed to trial. The only thing decided is if the complaint was accusing you properly. Nothing more. If the case survives your demur, the next step is your answer. You see it here in the lower right section of the demur process, on the way to trial. This is the first time that you're telling your side of the story. Until this time, it was all technicalities. From what you learned in the earlier videos, you know most of what your answer will say. The answer raises points that the demur could not, as well as the same things you raised in the demur. The landlord is blindsided by your case. For example, you say that you're entitled to a credit against rent for the $5.25 uh, repair that you made, so you don't owe the $50,000 he's suing for, but only $5.26 less. And you can win on that basis. If you do not uh, do discovery, you can bring up things you could have asked about, like the late fees being illegal, the prior three-day notice terminating the lease so no rent is due, or the wrong notice being used. If you've been following the game board, this revelation to him might be after spending a year getting to this point. He nervously consults his lawyer, who had promised to make quick work of you. Can you win on these bases? Yes, it's heading that way with the mounting evidence. In your answer, we also include a request for a jury trial. Eviction cases must be jury trials unless the tenant waives that right, and most do. Your asking for a jury poses four problems for the landlord. First is that the cost of trial just went from $1,000 to about 15000 and the lawyer wants it up front. The landlord is no longer impressed with his expensive lawyer, who has been outmaneuvered all these months by his unrepresented tenant. He sees this demand for money up front as a lack of confidence by the lawyer, despite his initial boasting. The second problem is that the jury might feel sorry for you, or otherwise decide differently than the pro-landlord judge, making this expensive trial also highly risky. The third problem is uh, that the landlord suspects that even if he won, he'd be unable to collect from you because you could just file bankruptcy or would be uncollectible otherwise. He'd just be putting good money after bad. The fourth problem is that, as he has come to realize, not only are you unafraid of him, but seem to be enjoying the eviction game. You're planning to sue him after winning and for a lot of money, even more expense for him. It's a steep downside that he never considered. The pawn has the king in check, and it's not looking so good for the landlord. The only, moving, uh, the only winning move was not to play, but here he is, neck deep, 
facing a trial. He wanted this fight when he thought it was slam dunk. Now he doesn't. What to do, what to do. After you file your answer, the landlord might file what is called a motion for summary judgment. It is a way for him to skip your jury trial, relying on the judge's pro-landlord bias and level of corruption. A summary judgment can legally only be granted if there is no dispute at all about the main facts. You can also file a motion for summary judgment if you have the clear evidence needed. If there are a million witnesses on one side and only one on the other, the summary judgment must be denied because there is a dispute. Issues from whether the notice was properly served to whether the conditions were uninhabitable or the event in question happened as claimed are all disputed claims to be decided by the jury. It's hard to imagine a situation where there is not some kind of factual dispute, let alone a legal dispute, to justify such a motion in an eviction case. Still, the landlords do file these occasionally when they have the right kind of judge. All you legally need to do to win that summary judgment motion is show that there are disputes as to the facts and or law, and the matter continues to trial. If the motion is granted for the landlord, you immediately file an appeal. You also require the judge to explain how that conclusion was reached. So as not to expose his fear of you, the landlord has his lawyer set the case for trial. He thinks that there's no way you could do a jury trial against his lawyer. You wouldn't know what to do or have the right papers ready. Yes. He's in denial, forgetting that you've been in control of the lawsuit since it began. His bullying has backfired badly. You have put him on the defense. He can only hope that you will be so scared of being in court that you will buckle and sign a settlement agreement that gives him everything. The landlord's lawyer even gets the judge to try to convince you that you don't have a case. We, the, we prepare the papers for you and coach you on making the presentation. You walk on into court, probably for the first time in the whole case, with all of your papers in order, more prepared than the landlord's lawyer. Your preparation and confidence is the final straw. Granted, everyone is nervous, even experienced trial lawyers, but you are not afraid. That scares the landlord. It was his only hope. He wonders what tricks you're going to pull at trial that his expensive lawyer is once again unprepared for. You even know how to handle the judge's discouragement. Your Honor, if you have such confidence in my landlord's case, why not let it go to trial? Give me my constitutional right to a jury who might see things differently than you. We could talk settlement, but I'm not going to negotiate with a gun to my head, nor without running it by my lawyer and going into the facts and law with the landlord who fuse, refuses to discuss those. You should have a plan of how you want things to be, ready for negotiation. If the landlord's lawyer is pushy, you remind him that after winning the case, you're going to sue him personally for malicious prosecution, and that you will be a witness for your landlord in his malpractice case against that lawyer. You tell him in front of your landlord that he is incompetent and has been ripping off your landlord all this time, when he should have told your landlord up front that he didn't have a case and to settle with you. He just wanted to exploit your landlord's anger and frustration that the lawyer helped build. He robbed your landlord of a fortune and attorney's fees, as well as cost him all the lost rent. While you are only defending your rights, the lawyer has been defrauding your landlord. He's the real cause of your landlord's losses. You actually feel sorry for your landlord being so abused by his own lawyer. Shame on him. He ought to be disbarred, etc. It's the truth, and it rings true for the landlord. You can agree to postpone the trial to work this out and not be forced to decide right there. 
If they push for a decision right there, you say no. Tell them that you're not signing any agreement without running it by your lawyer. And if they're trying to pull a fast one that your lawyer would catch, it convinces you that they know they will lose at trial. It's a con man who says, hurry up and sign. You can calmly work out the details over a week if they really want to settle, but otherwise, let's start trial right now. You will be prepared to do the trial yourself, but if you want to hire a lawyer to handle the trial for you, that can be arranged, although it can be very expensive. About 90% of cases settle on good terms. If you win the trial, you stay in possession. You can negotiate a new rental agreement and all the rest. The landlord could dismiss it on the day of trial, which is winning for you. You can then sue him and his lawyer for trying to evict you and everything else. If you lose the trial, you can still file an appeal and win on appeal. You get the judgment vacated and have a new trial or a judgment in your favor. You can start suing the landlord for all that he's done wrong while you're appealing. If you sue him for intentional misconduct other than breaching the contract, he can't turn it over to his insurance company, but has to pay the attorney's fees and your judgment against him out of his own pocket. You can ask the trial judge and the appeals court to let you stay in possession at the rental rate during the appeal. If they won't help you in that way, after winning on appeal, you can collect a huge judgment against your landlord for all that you suffered in having to move out pending appeal. And he can't even dismiss the case without paying you that money. <laughs> Maybe you just wanted to know what time it was, but I told you how the clock works. That's what legal advice is. <laughs> Using the game board approach, you are going to overpower your landlord, surprise him at every turn, and control the whole situation. Hopefully, from watching these videos, you have a much more detailed and sophisticated understanding. You certainly know more than your landlord does. You have learned what your rights are, why you're going to win, and how you're going to win. Knowledge is power. Bullies are cowards. That's why they're bullies. Stand up to him. Tell his other tenants about these videos. In fact, spread the word through your social media. Tenants across America need to get out of victim mode and take control. Register to vote and vote. Watch the video about that and you'll see why. You want to know what time it is? It's time for tenants to take control. That starts now and it starts with you.